Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course in Phonetics and Phonology Abroad Overview. Today we will start with Phonology. So till the last lecture we concentrated on various aspects of sounds including uh, phonetics, uh, articulatory phonetics, acoustic phonetics, perception, sounds of the different sounds of the languages of the world and we uh, now will start with a very important aspect of sounds that is as studied in linguistics and that is phonology. And in this lecture I will go a bit um, into the development of the field of phonology and where we are today and where do we get those uh, tools to analyze sounds from in the field of phonology. So uh, here as you can see um, there have been earliest attempts to study uh, phonetic properties of uh, sounds and 4th century BC grammar composed by Panini um, is one of them and um, in this the Shiva Shutra in Ashtadhyayi uh, has a list of phonemes in Sanskrit with a systematic notational system. Now this is considered to be the earliest and then there were other early attempts by the Greeks and also some um, Icelandic documents which show a systematic study of sounds. And after that um, there were major movements, major developments in the 19th century when uh, Polish uh, scholar Jan Bodo de Kortney and his students uh, Khrushchevsky and Scherba uh, presented a series of lectures in uh, 1876 to 1877 and gave concrete shape to the modern usage of the word phoneme. And um, the Courtney used the term phoneme for to express the relation between underlying sound alternations and related forms. So um, after that we have uh, Ferdinand de Saussure and whose work was uh, very influential in the development of the field of linguistics in general and his work showed that uh, linguistics can be studied scientifically and also the work he had done has shown that um, signs are important in uh, studying linguistics and so uh, with that uh, we can um, now think a bit about how phonological theory coincides with changes in uh, philosophical developments and ideas about the role of science and empiricism and positivism contributed significantly to the development of the field of linguistics. And Ferdinand de Saussure uh, influenced linguistics a lot and his death uh, brings a different kind of linguistics and then we have an era of structuralism from 1920s to 70s and there were a very significant attempts to uh, develop the field of linguistics as a discipline where um, it can be seen as true science. The premise of structuralism that there is no meaning without structure and that language is a system of structures was um, something which is developed greatly in the Prague school from 1926 to 1940s and where the importance of phonetics is played down a lot and later on Trubetskoy from 1890 to uh, was there from 1890 to 1938 and Jakobson uh, developed the foundation of modern day phonology, developed many of the key concepts, ideas, theoretical underpinnings and methodologies. Uh, principles of phonology um, 1939 um, uh, showed 
uh, phonemicization, neutralization and feature theory. The phoneme is seen as an abstract entity and a bundle of distinctive features and language is structured system of phonological oppositions. And emphasize that oppositions meaningful contrasts such as signs are um, not due to um, some mental image, but strictly audible contrast. And um, uh, since then we have um, more uh, developments in the idea of the phoneme. The Prague school develops the first formal expression of phonological theory and calls it phonological uh, opposition. And a difference of sound in a given language uh, that may serve to distinguish intellectual meaning. And a phonological unit is an unit of opposition. The idea of contrast being very essential for phonemes is something which is developed in the Prague school. And the phoneme as a minimal phonological unit is developed during that time. And only the phoneme consists of phonologically relevant properties and a realized speech sound cannot be a phoneme. So, we have a very firm um, establishment of the idea of phoneme during this time during the Prague school. The other important idea developed during that time is the idea of neutralization and uh, the idea of uh, context versus um, the structure and whether um, neutralization is determined by the context or whether it is determined by uh, the structure that is if uh, there is a voice voiceless contrast which is neutralized because of a context or because of structure because final position etc. Um, those were deemed to be different in um, this idea of neutralization. Uh, and also uh, minimal oppositions uh, were deemed to be important only common features were considered relevant and the neutralized sound was called the archiphoneme and uh, had to be context determined. Another important aspect is that the archiphoneme corresponds to the unmarked member of the oppositions. So, the idea of contrast that the contrast is essential is captured in this uh, idea of uh, minimal oppositions and uh, developed under neutralization in the Prague school. And um, another important idea uh, around that time was the greater number of phonemes which are distinguished has to uh, unmarked uh, member. So, um, American structuralism also uh, developed in uh, around that time and um, there were important differences between uh, the two and which we will look at in this lecture. The Prague school considered the phoneme to be uh, analyzable as a bundle of uh, distinctive features and uh, whereas um, American structuralism uh, regarded the phoneme as the smallest unit of analysis which means um, it was um, the underlying aspects of it were not considered important and, um, and the Prague school did not phonemicize prosodic aspects of phonology and whereas the American system had uh, stress intonational junctural uh, uh, properties that supra segment properties as and considered them as junctural phonemes. So, American des descriptive linguistics uh, offer different standpoints uh, from very prominent linguists such as Sapir, Pike and Nida. So, one of the hallmarks of the American descriptive school was that uh, unobservable facts uh, were not considered. Hence, uh, mentalist positions would consider uh, underlying forms which were not considered in American descriptive linguistics and explicit and replicable procedures were um, emphasized. And um, Bloomfield who was one of the most important member, uh, the smallest unit which makes uh, uh, considered phoneme to be the smallest unit which makes a difference in meaning and a minimum unit of distinctive sound feature also considered it to be a non-mentalistic unit phonology is the study of significant speech sounds. And also primary and secondary phonemes, uh, primary sounds are syllable forming, the secondary ones are tones and stress which um, uh, appear in larger structural units. 
and phonemes are defined by their participation in syllable structure, for instance, syllabic, non syllabic, open syllable, closed syllable, initial, medial, final. So, these structural positions were important in the Bloomfield's idea of the phoneme. And uh, then we have underlying forms, uh, which Bloomfield put some importance on and later argued for uh, morphophonemics separately, and he chose the simplest possible description. Another important um, person in the development of American structural uh, linguistics is Sapir. Um, uh, Sapir published language and introduction to the study of speech. Uh, he was a pioneer in the field of anthropological linguistic research, an approach which situates language primarily in social context. Sapir was the first to argue explicitly that the phoneme is a unit of perception by showing how phonemic perception could account for a variety of otherwise puzzling errors made by his native consultants. In one example, Tony, a native speaker of Sadan Paiute, being taught to write his language phonemically transcribed as Papa at the water as Papa and this is from Drescher 2011 and this is uh, we also discussed this uh, when we discussed the psychological reality of phonemes from the next uh, lecture onwards. So, Sapir's idea of phonology is mostly presented in two widely acknowledged papers and they are the sound patterns in language 1825 which promotes the psychological reality of sounds within a linguistic system and the other is the psychological reality of phonemes. So, one is the sound patterns in language and the second is the psychological reality of phonemes and in most of his ideas of phonology are uh, presented in these two uh, works by Sapir. And Sapir's point in the pattern approach uh, to the building blocks of phoneme is a system where it points an underlying uh, phonemic pattern and the phoneme is considered to be a set of contrastively underspecified features and in this uh, underspecified system what consists of the phoneme is merely the contrastive properties and this notion further uh, corresponded to the theory of distinctive features and this underspecification theory um, is understood in generative phonology as contrastive specification. Now one of the very important developments in phonological theory is the development of the idea of feature system of which uh, Jakobson can be called uh, the father of the distinctive feature theory. And um, so, distinctive features were characterized by uh, minimal linguistic units and they are supposed to be binary oppositions and the description should be based on a minimum number of features. And uh, these are selected from a limited set of universal features. The phonetic descriptions of the features is important and um, the feature value for the sounds for language are arranged as a feature matrix with plus and minus uh, values called the feature matrix. So, uh, this is the feature matrix for uh, English from uh, Jakobson um, Fant of Halle and um, we have to notice that this is only the 9 features here and um, the features are divided according to vocalic, non-vocalic, consonantal, non-consonantal, compact, diffuse, grave, acute, flat, plain and uh, something to be um, noticed here is that the same features. Um, so, for instance, grave, acute or flat plane are features which are, uh, are prosodic features and then compact diffuse or uh, consonantal, non-consonantal, vocalic, non-vocalic are features of so uh, segments. So, prosodic features and segmental features were uh, put together. Now, this was called the uh, protensity, the tense lax features and these are called tonality, uh, grave acute, grave acute versus flat, non-flat versus sharp, non-sharp 
So, uh, tens lakhs, um, tens lakhs is uh, not important for tonality, for tonality grave acute flat plane are important and another um, one which is a sharp non sharp which is not here. So, we can see that um, this feature matrix for English is different from the features that we use um, in linguistics because we can see that same features can be used for a lot of segments uh, which is not the case uh, anymore. Features are grouped together in depending on their cross linguistic behavior and also same features can be used for vowels and consonants which is also not the case to a great extent in the feature sets that we have and we do not have features which are um, described as flat or plain depending on their prosodic aspects which is not considered to be part of segmental descriptions anymore. But uh, this is one of the, uh, the feature metrics for English is one of the stepping stones for the development of feature theory in linguistics and this is uh, considered to be one of the hallmarks in the development of phonological tools which are available for us uh, to analyze uh, phonological problems. The formal development of distinctive feature theory is primarily due to Roman Jakobson and distinctive features are the minimal linguistic units in the system and not just classificatory dimensions. Only binary oppositions are accepted and descriptions are based on minimum number of distinctive features and these are selected from a limited set of universal distinctive features. The phonetic description of the distinctive features is important and the distinctive features for the sounds of a language are arranged as a matrix with plus, minus and null values. So, um, there are these inherent features as we see here. Uh, these inherent features are um, sonority and also acoustic features are considered inherent features in Jakobson's feature theory and that is why a vocalic, non-vocalic and glottal source, glottal source and free vocal tract, formants and um, consonantal, non-consonantal where low F1, low intensity, obstruction, all these uh, could be inherent features in uh, Jakobson's feature theory. Also, there are other aspects of relating to suprasegmental properties like protensity and tense lacks, longer duration of steady state and greater deviation of vocal tract from neutral uh, configuration, tonality and grave acute uh, predominance of energy in lower part of the spectrum etc. are there as inherent features. Also uh, flat, non-flat and lowering and weakening of higher frequency energy, narrowing at back or front of resonator, sharp, non-sharp, raising and strengthening of higher frequency energy dilation of back resonator with palatal structure. So, all these are inherent features. In this chart, what you see as non-consonantal and grave acute uh, tense lags is um, expanded here and you can see that what is considered um, consonantal, non-consonantal, -cons the low F1 and um, low intensity, the formal frequencies uh, could be uh, considered for the consideration of vowels versus um, consonants and also other acoustic properties such as nasal resonator and um, nasal formant etc. for nasals and burst or fast transition strident, mellow and high intensity and high frequency and supplementary obstruction etc. Checked unchecked if for the checked unchecked also a higher energy discharge in shorter time etc. were considered for components of features in Jakobson's feature theory. So, this is uh, only a brief overview of Jakobson's uh, feature matrix for English and uh, this is not going to be uh, asked for any evaluative purposes and only to uh, show you that these were the features which were there in Jakobson's um, feature matrix and we will uh, look extensively at the feature, the list of features which are considered important in phonological theory now in the later lectures. So, this feature matrix as we just said has a few drawbacks as a result of which the, it was 
developed further and further in the phonological literature and the feature theories which we have currently will be discussed in another class but this is where it all started with the feature matrix for English English as shown here. The uh, goal of generative phonology is to develop a formal um, theory which correctly models phonological naturalness, develops an algorithm for finding the correct grammar. And um, so, uh, generative phonology now uh, starts after what we saw in 19th century and, um, and in the early um, 20th century. So, there were great developments in the idea of the phoneme, in uh, analysis, in the idea of development of the idea of features and also uh, other uh, analytical tools. Uh, with the advent of generative phonology, the goal of our of linguistic analysis was uh, received a slight modification. Now, it is to develop a formal theory, which correctly models phonological naturalness and develops an algorithm for finding the correct grammar. So, th this uh, quotation that is from um, Goldsmith and Lacks, Generative Phonology, Its Origins, Principles and Successors. So, given a set of observations from a language to determine which of a set of analysis is the best. So, the goal is not to develop a function which generates the grammars given the data except in the relatively trivial sense in which all uh, possible grammars can be enumerated. So, this function is an evaluation metric. So, the goal of generative phonology was to develop evaluation metrics which will finally give us an algorithm for finding the correct grammar. And note that this correct grammar has to be not just descriptive, it has to be explanatory as well and it has to it has to base itself on phonological naturalness and it has to be a formal theory. So, we um, developed the theory from a stage where we were not very clear about, about the basic minimal units to a stage where we can develop formal theory. So, there we can say that there were there was significant um, development in um, the way we analyze uh, phonology. And secondly, the phonological grammars themselves uh, algorithmically that is fully explicitly in a fashion compatible with digital computer such as a Turing machine generate surface forms on the basis of underlying forms composed by a lexicon or morphological component. So, and again this is another uh, important point that you may take note that it has to be algorithmically explicit so that you can think of a digital computer such as a Turing machine which generates surface forms on the basis of underlying forms. So, generate surface forms, generate surface forms on the basis of underlying forms. Now, how can you generate surface forms on the basis of underlying forms? Obviously, there has to be a process um, involved. So, we will see that the processes involved during this part of development of phonology were mostly rules. So, you, you can generate, generate surface forms, generate surface forms uh, from underlying forms and with the help of rules. So, a couple of important ideas is that um, phonologies uh, should employ derivational means, um, sequential processual analysis to generate the forms of a language. So, the derivational means is important here to understand that we will see how um, those derivational means were employed and um, to generate the forms of a language and the observed forms are to be out to be the output of phonological rules which are applied on an underlying form which we had just said phonological rules are applied on the underlying form. So, we have the underlying form on which phonological rules are applied. So, 
So, we have a UR which is uh, subjected to a phonological role. So, then uh, the other issue is that of phonological representations. So, now with the advent of generative phonology, we have an approach where um, we saw the importance of features which was developed uh, initially by Jacobson van Halle. The features gained a lot of importance and as a result other representations for instance that of the syllable were no longer used. So, generative phonology put a lot of emphasis on features when it was developing. And then uh, we have phones which were to be represented as a bundles of binary features. So, now the importance of um, phonemes is can be seen and uh, the other important idea is that of total ordering. So, what is total ordering? So, suppose there are uh, total uh, there are two rules then there should be a complete uh, grammar as to why one rule should be um, ordered before another rule. So, if we have a rule which says that there should be lengthening of a of a consonant of a, a voice um, consonant has to be lengthened before a vowel and then we have another rule which says that a voice consonant suppose is deleted in a position and then uh, if we have a, a lengthened vowel as a result. So, we have to we have to order those two rules to find out whether we have a lengthened vowel already or we have a lengthened vowel as a result of the deletion just of the consonant. This is just an instance to show that um, uh, total ordering involved the uh, if there were rules A, B, uh, C. So, um, why um, A or B or C uh, has to be ordered, there has to be a total ordering of these pairs. So, this idea of generative phonology which we can see as a development beyond what we saw as structural linguistics before the development of generative phonology um, was uh, can be uh, attributed to um, Chomsky and Halle 1968 sound patterns of English the sound pattern of English. So, uh, this um, the main ideas uh, here in the sound pattern of English can also be called the cognitive turn. So, phonology was seen to be a function of human uh, mental uh, processes and language is a where language is a computational system and where uh, the methodology where the methodology of uh, pursuing this of this idea of language a computational system obviously included tools which were previously there that is data collection, but now with an increased emphasis on on typology. So, data had to be collected from languages, but there was an increased importance of typology. So, as to see what are the universal uh, characteristics and cast your analysis in such a way that reflects typological considerations. And typological generalizations therefore, became very important as uh, the idea of the universal uh, properties of sounds gained more and more importance. And um, other aspects such as observational adequacy to which uh, helps in the final run to correctly generalize um, based on what we see in one language correctly generalize across data sets. And this method ensure descriptive adequacy as well as explanatory adequacy, because uh, not only um, do you describe the um, data in front of you, but you also uh, go ahead and explain why the data behaves in a certain way. So, if there is a lengthening of a, of a vowel before a voice consonant, then why 
um, why does it happen? If there is word final devoicing, why does it happen? Do we see this in language after language? Then there must be something in the uh, in that property which is um, inducing these these properties. So, uh, with the goal to uh, the finally the goal of uh, generative phonology is then to understand the internal the properties of the way the mind brain works or the brain works. And um, this can be uh, contrasted with structuralist approaches which put importance on the phoneme and allophone on complementary distribution as to um, see where uh, where the two sounds have contrastive distribution or complementary distribution, where the contrast is, where it is occurring or is if it does not occur in the uh, same position, then it must be in complementary distribution. So, those ideas of contrastive distribution and complementary distribution could be attributed to the structuralist approaches. The structuralist ap approaches did not put a lot of emphasis on um, underlying representations and things which could not be observed and the phonetic as aspect was uh, given more importance. Whereas, in the generative approach we have um, underlying representations and which are then mapped to sur surface representations. And um, in structuralist approaches again um, data collection was important, but because of the uh, approach which did not put a lot of emphasis on the cognitive aspects, but it put more emphasis sometimes on the, on the socio-cultural aspects um, did not um, really uh, strive for that kind of an explanatory adequacy which is uh, seen in generative phonology. Also, however, the structuralist approaches uh, contributed to our general understanding of phonology, to our understanding of uh, phonemes and various um, and the crucial ideas about opposition, about minimal units, about um, also our ideas about features etcetera. They were all developed during the phase when uh, 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 structuralism was prevalent. And we have seen the trajectory of this development of um, phonology from a, a level where we did not know uh, what phonemes uh, were. So, and um, it, the way things develop from uh, Saussure to all the way to sound pattern of English and the generative, um, the, the cognitive uh, uh, development that we uh, have seen in, in uh, linguistics. And we have again uh, from there, again there have been many developments in phonology which we have not included here, but from the Next class, we will uh, look at the phonemic analysis in uh, linguistics in phonology. So, what is the phonemic analysis? So, basically, in the phonemic analysis, we try to find out phonemes from given data sets, and there are various ways of doing this phonemic analysis. We will study this in great detail and we will uh, perhaps um, also uh, look at the great uh, importance of phonemic analysis in phonological literature and not just that we will also look at how phonemic analysis may have had some drawbacks and from there we will also see what are the other available options of for analyzing phonological analysis which have been developing from the 19th century. Thank you very much for your attention. I will see you in the next lecture.